soil, the conditions change. You can have things come up that weren't growing there before just because you've changed the conditions. So over over like several years of farming, you'll start to see different types of weeds that you didn't have before, just because they're sort of proliferating in your soil. Okay, and what types of things do you do to deal with weeds? Weeds we really cultivate by hand. It's all done mechanically by hand. I do a little bit of tractor cultivation on my bigger crops, like, like the corn, where I can get the tractor set up and, and tear through there with blades behind my wheels and, and, and get a lot of the weeds that way. But for most of the crops we're weeding by hand. We use a, a, a hand hoe. It's a, like a stirrup blade hoe. Okay. It's like a thin blade and kind of a slightly flattened, uh, it's not completely flat, but it's got like a little bit of a bend to it. You just use it in this pulling motion towards you. Um, the biggest thing that I've found about weeding is that the timing is really critical. You have to weed before the weeds get too big or you wind up doing a lot more work. Um, and so getting to the weeds at just the right point is really important in terms of being efficient. Uh, also, the moisture level of the soil is really important when you're weeding. So in our climate where it's dry and we can control the moisture level, you know, I try to make sure that the soil that we're, we're cultivating, hoeing, um, is not soaking wet because it'll just, the mud will just clog up your tool. You also don't want it to be super, super dry because the soil just gets hard when it's dry, but it's got to be kind of somewhere in between, a little bit of moisture. And then right after we cultivate, we want the weeds that have been cut up to just bake in the sun so we don't want to irrigate for another day or two after we weed. Okay. And then we can start to irrigate again. Um, you know, where you're where you're in a climate where you're relying on rain, you, you have to really, like, <clears throat> be on top of, okay, like, it, today's the day we've got to weed today because the conditions are right. So the, the weeding is most effective when the conditions are, are perfect. The, the weeds are at the right height, the moisture level's right. Um, so, to me, being really successful about weeding is just keeping at it all season, kind of starting early. I start when the weeds are just like tiny, tiny weeds and you can barely see them and we just start. And it's very quick, like you just weed a whole bed in almost no time because there's not much. You don't even see much and it's very quick, but, but still it makes a difference. Um, so I just kind of try to start early and, and stay on top of it. How often do you weed? Well, you know, it's it, it's kind of like a part of our season. Like early in the season, we're, we're doing greenhouse work and field prep work. Then we're getting to planting big time. And usually by the middle of May, we're almost done with our planting and we're really getting into weeding. And then we have a period of about like a month and a half where that's like all we do. Uh, and I hire a crew. I bring people in to help us with weeding because it's a big labor need that we suddenly have. Um, and then it kind of goes on. You know, it's, it kind of trickles in and then it gets really big and then it kind of goes on for almost the rest of the season. It kind of slows down towards the end because we stop weeding certain crops and other crops we have to weed again or maybe, you know, a second or third time. Okay, and what do we have here? These are artichokes. This is the rest of the artichokes. They're really kind of finishing up. Here's the broccoli. Got some wild turkeys out there. I don't know if you can see the turkeys. Oh, yeah. They like to eat the bugs too. And they don't tromp on the crops too bad, huh? No, we, we did notice some damage in our lettuces this year, but not too much. They, they, they really move quite a bit. They don't, they don't tend to stop and, you know, do too much con uh, concentrated damage. And how many turkeys do you have out here? I have no idea. There are several groups. They're wild. Uh, probably 50. Are there any artichokes? Oh yeah, here are a couple on the plant. You can see the ladybugs all over them. Yeah, was I telling you about that? This is the, you see, what you see here is really cool. You've got the ladybugs that are eating the aphids. And the other thing you get is, I don't see it so much right now, but you get ants that farm the aphids. The ants, there's an ant, they bring the aphid eggs up and they put them on the plants and then they come back and they harvest the little baby aphids to eat. Okay. Uh, and then the, the ladybugs kind of key in on it, and there's a lot of wasps that come in, too. And, I mean, these plants, right now, I, don't, it's, I think it's just kind of cooled down, so it's slowed down. But in the middle of the summer, it was just like crazy. You could barely walk in here. It was just insects everywhere. 
And so ladybugs are pretty much your primary beneficial around here, it seems like. They're a big beneficial for sure. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of them in here. There's a lot. The celery in our climate tends to get really tough. So what I'm trying to do here is hill it up. I'm trying to use a tractor to bury these things with dirt. And then that'll sort of blanch them and make them turn white and tender, hopefully. Nice. I can almost smell the peanut butter and raisins. <laughs> Alright, we're almost at the end here. Mm, it's good. Talk a little bit about drip tape. So this whole section here is all being irrigated with this drip tape. And this is like the most efficient way to irrigate. Um, the water's just pushed down into the tube, and there's little holes that are kind of pre-drilled into this seam that allows the water to dribble out. And so for the whole run, there's like a little bit of water dribbling out every 12 inches, and the, the lines stay on for a long time, like five or six hours, until it's saturated. Um, it's very efficient. You're not watering, you know, in between the beds, so I've got one row of crop, and then I've got a five or six foot space, and then another row of crop, and I've just got water going where the crop is. So also less weeding, because you're not watering your weeds. Um, and also a lot of these crops, they don't really like the overhead water as much. They really, they don't, they don't like to be watered on their leaves. So anyway, that's drip tape. Um, you know, I mean, just, irrigation is just a huge thing out here in the desert, so. I don't know, it just probably doesn't apply to other places where it rains all the time, but for us, you know, that's a big technological innovation. And so you've got some main pipes, and then you keep branching down, branching down, and the drip tape's obviously at the end of the whole mm -hmm. chain. Yeah. Yeah, we have a, um, a really big four-inch main pipe that's buried, and then that comes up into these risers every 40 feet and then on these risers I can either go with a sprinkler line where I'll have a sprinkler head every 30 feet or I can go into a PVC pipe and then go into the drip tapes. Okay so it goes to PVC up at the other end there? No the PVC will be down. I could just like this here. Okay. I could, I could. I see. Sprinklers. Gotcha. And then from the PVC it goes into that drip tape. Okay. Do you have one of the drip tapes starting off from the PVC somewhere? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to see it. Okay. That's what it looks like. Wow. And all I really do is I... Looks like that one wasn't working. Um, you know, it's a very simple system. I. I drill a hole in the PVC that's slightly smaller than the outside diameter of this tube. Okay. And I cram the tube in there. And then I poke a hole in the, tu in the t uh, drip tape and cram the tube in there. And that's my, that's all of my whole technology. And then you just pinch off both ends of the drip tape. Yeah, I just hide in a knot. Okay. They do make special fittings for all this stuff. You know, they make a special fitting for this part. They make a special fitting for tying off the end. They make a special fitting for this. I just learned this kind of cheap way of doing it where you don't have to have any fittings. If it works, that's what matters. Um, you know, and at a certain point in the season, you don't, you can't check the line anymore. When we first fill it up, we go down, make sure it's not leaky anywhere, make sure there's no tears or whatever. At this point in the season, if I were to make, wanted to make sure it was working, I would basically just go to the other end. And if there was water at the other end, I'd be pretty confident there'd be water dripping out the whole way. Okay. Very productive. Everyone here loves to eat sweet corn. Would also make great silage crop for a cow. You know, the cow would eat the whole thing. And I know that most types of sweet corn 
for modern farming have been bred so that there's only one ear per really? stalk of corn. That's probably true. Is is that how this corn is, or? No, no, this one will produce a couple per. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what variety of corn is this? Do you know? It's called delectable. Okay. I mean, it is a hybrid, um, but it's not like genetically modified. It's just a cross mm -hmm. between two types. Um, carrots. Oh yeah. The sunflowers. The sunflowers are really uh, just for selling for cut flowers. I've got a nice fall crop of carrots here. And we're just kind of picking at those. They'll go for a couple weeks, a few weeks maybe. A lot of different varieties. Oops, some in your light. Yeah, I'm just gonna try and pull one out I here. Oh, I see you. You might just pull the top. <sighs> here, here you go. Okay. These are the little guys, these are cute. These are the little, like, Thumbelinas. Nice. <laughs> but some of them are bigger. This is the type. Do you have different varieties in here? Yeah, a lot of different varieties. So, this is my, this is my little label. It'll say what the varieties are. Atlas, uh, Danvers, and Nantes. Those are the three varieties in this bag. Okay. So each, each bag's got different varieties. This is the yellow sun here. the water and then they'll come out a little easier. Sometimes we sometimes we have to bring the pitchfork out actually to get these guys out. Nice. Depends on the variety. There you go. Yeah yeah look at that. That's a healthy looking carrot. Mm -hmm. Lots of carrots still to be picked. There's some basil and scallions. Okay. There's the rest of the beans. Those were highly productive and we had to just stop picking them because we just kind of ran out of labor. So these are onions. You were showing us one of the onions you just picked here. Yep. And so and walla walla. I was saying that I plant them from I plant them from little onion transplants. So someone else grows them from seed. They probably start them in the fall. They overwinter them, and then when I buy them in the spring for transplanting, they're just tiny little onion shoots. Nice. And this was like two thousand. Okay. And what is this? Maybe an eighth of an acre or something? No, like not that? even. No, it would be. Um, well, about about 24 beds per acre, and it was just two beds, so like a twelfth of an acre. Okay. Yeah. Get that. Here we've got a bunch of lettuce. Mm -hmm. Is there anything tricky about the lettuce? Well, in our climate, um, to keep the lettuce tender summer, I plant it over and over and over again. Okay. That's the big secret, is just always having a fresh crop. So I have a lot of land here, so I, I till up a new section and plant a new section of salad about every week in the summer. Okay. Maybe two weeks go by at the longest. That's and a good then trick. We'll, we'll harvest the lettuce, and then when it's starting to get a little bit too big, we're, we're already ready to move on to the next patch. Okay. And so your greenhouse is mainly for starting stuff? Well, we've got a few. We've got one greenhouse that's heated, and that'll be, we'll fire that up in the end of February, beginning of March, and that's for growing our our long season crops like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants that need a really long growing season, so we have to start those really early. Okay. Um, then this hoop house and then that hoop house out in the field there are both kind of designed for providing extra heat during the growing season. Um, so certain crops in our climate, such as melons, do not really ripen up very well because it's so cool here in the evenings. Okay. So by having that plastic layer, even though it's open at the end uh, and open on the sides, it will retain a huge amount of heat. Plus, of course, it's much hotter in there during the day. 